Okay, so now we're recording as well. Um, someone says they, um, they're interested in my work on chloroplethor. That is a great reason to be here today. Um, as you'll see, when I start the course, I mentioned that I have, I have four courses on chloroplethor now, um, and I'm gonna cover as much as I can about them here. But there's still things that I haven't had times, time to make a course on. And so uh, the CDC gave me an hour to, to talk. So I really did get to include um, a lot of things I think are important, but I just haven't been able to make courses about. Uh, someone says they're here because they're curious about accessing CDC data and getting more R skills. And that's, you're definitely going to learn that. Um, some people at the CDC asked me to include an example from CDC data, and I am, uh, I did do that, and uh, you're the first to know I'm thinking of running a, uh, a competition. It'll be the third competition I've done, um, and this time the theme will be CDC data, so uh, look, look to learn more about that in the coming weeks. And someone says they've heard a lot about Coreplet, they've seen my blog posts, and are interested in census data, and uh, they missed the talks last week. So this person may actually work at the CDC. So we're up to 36 people. So I think, and it's it's um, it's four after the hour. So let's just jump in. Hello, everyone. My name is Ari Lampstein, and today I'm going to be giving an introduction to Choroplether. Please do not be afraid of the name Choroplether. It may be um, simply a mistake that I named it an incomprehensible word, but I hope that by the end of today, uh, you will think that the, the software itself is pretty neat, even if the name is not neat. I've been working on Choroplether for a few years now, and last week I had the honor of talking about Choroplether at the CDC R Users Group. And uh, that talk went well, and I wanted to share it with the wider audience, and um, that's exactly what this talk is. The CDC gave me a full hour to talk. That's the, actually the longest talk I've ever given. And so I split the, the talk into several sections. The first section, as you see here, is obviously the introduction. And at the end of each section, I have a slide that says, do you have questions about this section? So um, if you do have questions, you can ask them at any time. You can wait to the end of a section or you can wait to the, to the end of the entire presentation. Um, I just wanted to let you know up front that um, I'm here to help you guys learn the material. So if you do have questions, please feel free to ask. So what are we looking at here? These are all maps that are made with the Choroplether package. And let's also talk about um, what, <coughs> what a choropleth map actually is. Um, all of these maps are choropleth maps. And a choropleth is any map that shows regions such as states, counties, countries, and expresses a value for those regions through color. So I mentioned all four of these maps are choropleth maps. Um, and they all have different regions. So going through them all, it's US states, US counties, countries of the world, and then prefectures, which are state equivalents of Japan. And they all have different data sets. Uh, US income, which comes from the US Census Bureau, US unemployment, which comes from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, life expectancy at birth, which comes from the World Bank's World Development Indicators, and uh, Japanese population, prefecture population, which comes from the Japanese um, Census Bureau. And the point I'm making here is that 
uh, Coroplet there not only has a lot of built-in maps, it also has a lot of built-in functionality for working with um, open data sets. I thought a lot of people might be curious who I am. My name is Ari Lamstein, and I have a website at arielamstein.com. I created Quarterplether as well as several other packages. Uh, right now, I work as an R trainer and consultant, and I also recently created a membership site for R programmers called profitableportfolios.co. Previously, for the bulk of my career, I worked as a software engineer and data analyst in San Francisco. I want to point out that you can download the slides and also the code for the Shiny app I'll be showing later at cdctalk.com. And if you visit there now, you can enter in your email address and I will send you the slides. Here are some of the, the most common questions I get. Uh, why on earth did I name the package Coroplether? Um, Coroplether is a play on the words Coropleth map and R programming language. That's it. Um, when I created it, I thought that the name was funny and I didn't really expect anyone else to be using the package. Um, and now it's become popular and um, I frequently get teased about the choice of name. Uh, it was designed to be easy to use. Um, I needed to analyze data with maps at my last job at a real estate company. And I especially needed to do exploratory data analysis with maps. And uh, R didn't quite have the tools I needed, the exact tools I needed, which is why I built it. And I also want to mention that I have a software engineering background, which means um, software engineers write software that winds up needing to be maintained by other software engineers. So there's a lot of um, patterns that we use and I brought them into this R package as well. Everyone in the R community or maybe even the broader data science community I feel comes from a different background and that's, that's my background. And I wanna point out that this last point is probably the single most important point in the, the slide deck, which is that if you're using Coropleather, the most important thing to know is that everything is a region value pair. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at all of these maps, uh, as a software engineer, you could say they're all uh, I'm trained to look at what's the common element between all of them. And yes, the data varies between the maps. Uh, yes, the actual geography varies, but every Coropleth map at its heart is just a region value pair. I mentioned earlier, I've created four courses about Coropleth and I'm going to try and cover as much as I can from them in one hour. The courses are Learn to Map Census Data in R, which is, of course, my, my free course that you see if you visit my homepage. I also created a course called Map Making in R with Coropleather that goes into much more detail. Um, and that was the, the first serious course I made with, with videos and, and downloadable code and so on. Uh, shape files for R programmers is if you want to extend Coropleather to, to deal with a custom geography. And then I have a course on Shiny called Learn Shiny in Afternoon, where I teach you how to build a census explorer with Shiny. Does anyone have any questions about the introduction? All right. Then let's get started. The uh, most important lesson about Coropleather, I think, is to understand how you can use it to conduct exploratory data analysis. 
And I mentioned that Choropleather was really designed to be easy to use. And you can see that here. If you simply load Choropleather, and here I'm looking at this code, and load this data frame, all you need, this data frame, by the way, DFPOP state contains state population estimates. If you run this function, state Choropleth, and give it the data, you'll, you'll get this map. So you really don't need to do anything in order to start creating um, informative maps with Choropleth. And, and I mentioned here, of course, you can put the question mark before DFPOP state and get help and learn more about that data frame. And similarly, you can type question mark state Choropleth and get more help about um, the state Choropleth function. When I run workshops, I always point out that, at least in my opinion, there, there's no one right map. Uh, this map, is, and I ask people, I challenge them, when we create different maps, to always draw one interpretation from the map. And so you could see here, my interpretation is that these four states, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming, they're a, a real cluster of low population states. And similarly, uh, California, Texas, and Florida, they're all large states and they're all dark blue, so they have a large population. And so that's another interpretation I draw. But so this map is useful, it tells us something, but I also wanna point out that this largest uh, color here, this largest bin, is encompasses a very large range from 11 million to 37 million. And with this map, we can't see which states are up at 37 million and which are down at 11 million. If you pass in the parameter num colors and set it to one, then the outliers really stand out. And we do that by using a continuous scale. And you can see here that California is really the largest population state, followed by Texas and then perhaps Florida or New York. You can also explore the data by using two colors. And if you do this, you'll see which states are above and below the median. And this is actually an interesting pattern here that all of these uh, below median states tend to be, uh, most of them are, are contiguous right over here and then up here in the Northeast. A very common way that people want to explore maps is by zooming in and Choropleth lets you do that with this parameter called zoom. And you can see here, we're zooming in on the three uh, states, California, Oregon, and Washington that uh, are on the Pacific coast. Uh, well, lastly, I wanna point out that uh, when I took a geography course, I learned that there's two basic types of maps, uh, thematic maps and reference maps. And everything we've seen so far is a thematic map. And, and all that that means is, yes, we see these, these borders, we see these regions, and then there's only one story that's being told about those regions. By contrast, the types of maps that you get from Google Maps are called reference maps, and they'll show things like state names, bodies of water, major roads, um, where there are mountains. And sometimes, We have, a, we have a question here. Let me just finish this section and then I'll get to your question. Um, sometimes, especially when you're zooming in on a small region, it's useful to also see, to overlay your choropleth map over a reference map. And that's because you'll often, um, uh, you'll often, people often won't know what they're looking at. And choropleth lets you do that by setting this parameter reference map equal to true. And lastly, even though it's not really exploratory data analysis, um, you can set a title and a legend by using the title and legend parameters. And so summing up how Choropleth lets you do uh, 
exploratory data analysis, I want to point out that each map is a single function. You can explore the data with the num colors argument. You can zoom with the zoom parameter. You can set reference maps or overlay or choropleth map over a reference map. And you can set a title and a legend as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? So I'm looking at this question here. You have a data of geo points that are printed in R, but how the borders of the country regions are printed. Ah, if you want to know, oh, your question was answered by reference maps. Perfect, perfect. So let's give a brief introduction to how Coraplether handles data. Before I showed this map, and I pointed out that if you have a data frame with state population, all you need to do is call this one function. But, but how does that work? Obviously, you can't, um, you can't just give state choropleth any data. You can't give it the number one and expect it to make a map from that. And so let's look at uh, what this data frame actually is. And um, if you look at it with the function head, you'll see that there's two columns. And I mentioned this before, there's a region and a value. And as long as your, um, your data frame has regions that line up with the map and values, which are either numbers or characters, Coraplether will make a map of it. And once you have this rule, um, you can actually get a lot of freedom. So you can build very complex things with very simple rules. So I went to the state of uh, the Census Bureau and I got all of this data um, and in a data frame called DF State Demographics. And you'll notice there's no value column here but there's all sorts of interesting demographic statistics that people tend to be interested in. And Coraplether makes mapping this data very easy. So I mentioned there wasn't a value column, but Coraplether requires one. And so you can just create one by saying DF state demographics dollar sign value is equal to say, DF state demographics dollar sign percent white. And then you map it and Coraplether will give you this map. And this map really shocked me when I created it. Before I created it, I didn't realize there was this pattern in America where the Northern states have a higher percentage of residents that are white. Similarly, if you look at the map for percent black and uh, use num colors equals two, which shows states that are above and below the median, you can see that uh, the eastern half of America is, tends to be where all of the states that have above the median percent black are located. And similarly, if you look at percent Hispanic and use a continuous scale, you'll see that all of the states uh, with the highest the sort of outliers in terms of percent Hispanic uh, border Mexico. And interestingly, New Mexico even stands out here as an outlier of outliers. And I think that in this data set, which is from 2013, it had 48% Hispanic. So there wasn't any state that was in this data set that was over 50%. Does anyone have any questions about the basics of how Coraplether handles data. I see a few really advanced questions, so I'm going to handle those guys all the way at the end. Were there any questions about the, um, the data?
I now want to talk, ah, someone asked, can you display Puma? Uh, I think that's public use micro data area. I think that's the, that's what that acronym stands for. It's a, a geography by, published by the Census Bureau. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a small census. The answer is yes, you can. Um, Choropleather, the way that Choropleather works is by um, taking a shape file you have and rendering it at the end of the day with ggplot, but providing a uh, providing some error checking and some visualization functions that, that I found I kept on referring to. So if you get the Puma from the Census Bureau, you can certainly do that. Um, but you will need to get the shape file and you'll learn, you'll need to learn probably how to deal with it in a, in a program like QGIS, which is a, an open source GIST program, and then also how to import it into R and then import it into, um, into Choropleather. And that's exactly what the course shape files for our programmers will teach you. Um, yes, so the answer is yes, but you need to, you need to learn some know-how to do it. Um, and can it work for non-US geography locations? And the answer is uh, absolutely. So I have a section uh, at the end um, not at the end, in, in a few sections called where I go through all of the maps that are currently shipped with Choropleather. And I think that, um, Simundar, what geography are you particularly looking to deal with? Yeah, so not only the country of India, but the what's called the administrative level one of India is already in Choropleather which is just the, the states of India. The states of virtually every country are handled. They're, they're called administrative level one maps. Uh, and I'll be talking more about that later. Um, Stoney asked a question that uh, I wanna answer now, how to change the state label size. To do that, um, you would need to override the, the rendering function that handles that. And um, if you go to GitHub, you, you could see how it's handled. You just want to change that line. Um, that, that wasn't designed to be easy to change, um, unfortunately. And changing the, stickness, the thickness of the state lines. Um, Choropleather really is, it just returns a ggplot object. So you can, um, you could just do plus and then whatever that, that, that code is, that border code, and change the thickness that way. Let me uh, just go to the end here. So let's go to uh, Census API integration. So when I say census data, the census produces um, a lot of different data sets. The one that I refer to when I say census data is the American Community Survey, or ACS. And I wanna point out that this is a really complex survey. And because I was talking to the CDC, um, uh, someone just asked about, does it, does Corpus include the newly divided state um, in, in uh, India that just divided into two? Um, almost certainly it doesn't. Uh, and in the course, Map making in R with Choropleather, I, a big part of that course is to uh, talk deeply about where the maps come from and to point out that maps change all the time. And then the companion course, Shape Files for R Programmers, teaches you how to get your own um, shape file and to make a Choropleather object from it. Uh, but back to, to the ACS, uh, because I was talking to the CDC, I made a point of, of talking in some detail about this data, and I, and I pointed out that this is a very complex survey. 
the, centen the Census Bureau has a decennial census every 10 years that counts every single person. And so it, it can very easily say what those results are. The ACS samples a portion of the population every year, and therefore there are estimates. Um, they're, they're sampling the population, so they provide estimates that have a, a margin of error that I'm not going to talk about the margin of error today. And it also means that you can't just ask for data from a particular year because each year is also divided up into spans. So they could tell you the results of sampling the population this year, or they can average the data from, uh, from the last five years. And Coraplether uses a R package called ACS that uh, handles getting this data from the Census Bureau. And the data frame, uh, the function that you care about for this is called get state demographics. And I just wanted to point out that this is that, that function, get state demographics, and, and it's quite complicated. And uh, because I was speaking at the CDC, I, I made a point of saying things like uh, how the federal government handles um, race and, and ethnicity is very complicated. And, and I don't want to talk, talk about that in detail. But if you, uh, for your work, if, if those nuances are really important, you may want to take a look at, at how I calculate that. And then you may want to um, use your own uh, methodology. But I want to point out that once you can measure, uh, once you can easily get this data in a mappable format, you can do all sorts of interesting analyses. So uh, here I link to a guest blog post I wrote called a Following Up on News Stories of Cora Plether and R. And what started this is that I read a book on fracking in America. And this book made a point that once um, these, these, these formations were able to be uh, exploited or, or uh, um, turned into oil and gas, um, the demographics of North Dakota changed very, very quickly. And that really surprised me. North Dakota before fracking was, was having a very difficult time and they were actually thinking of, of changing their name to sort of rebrand the state. And then fracking came along and this particular formation called the Bakken Formation, which is right under North Dakota, um, all of a sudden it could be turned into oil and gas and they saw a huge boom. And you could see that here that North Dakota between 2010 and 2015 saw a tremendous increase in per capita income that dwarfs any other state. And um, this is what I, I really enjoy about Cora Plether is that studying these um, demographics all of a sudden becomes very easy. Uh, and I'll just point out that I'm kind of fudging things a bit. Um, I haven't yet told you how to make these custom legends. You know, here negative numbers are red. So you can see Nevada had a decrease in per capita income. And um, North Dakota is a plus, is a huge plus up here. And then the middle is white. And so I'm including the code about it. Um, these are some of the, uh, quote, advanced features of Cora Plether that I talk more about in my other courses. Um, but I, I wanted to include that map without going into these, these details today. And to the person who asked about uh, changing the thickness of borders, um, this is what that code would sort of look like. Does anyone have any questions about the census API integration? Okay, there were a lot of questions about um, other maps that Core Plether can, can make. And I want to point out up until now, I was only talking about US state maps and I was doing that because I wanted to talk about other features like um, exploratory data analysis 
and um, data and census ATI, census uh, API integration. Oh, there, there is a question here, a late coming question. Um, don't they now derive the 10 year census from the annual census? The, the answer is no. Um, I, I believe that they do not do that. Um, and another question was, there is an there is a annual ACS and a five year ACS. Yes, there is. There also used to be a three year ACS, um, but that was dropped for budget reasons. And does the census API include the latest year of info? I believe it does. Um, and the, if you want to know more about that, I recommend uh, contacting the maintainer of the ACS package, Ezra Haber Glenn. He has a, a list serve where he answers questions on all the time. I know that not all data from the Census Bureau is available via the, the API. So um, one of the things I tried to do with Coroplether was to focus on data that was interesting and that could easily, uh, it was dependable. But there's also, uh, Core Plether also lets you get tables by ID. And I'm not talking about that today. Uh, there's documentation for that on my website. Uh, but then you frequently run into this question of what data is available or isn't. Um, and and that's, that's difficult. Things aren't documented for the API quite as well as, as one would like. So again, uh, but, um, I'm gonna skip the question that just came in because I wanna finish uh, the, the slides within an hour and then we could, uh, I could answer your question at the end. Um, I wanna talk about uh, more maps. So as I was saying up until now, I just talked about state maps so that I could um, focus on exploratory data analysis and, and census API integration and so on. Um, but now I wanna talk about the wealth of maps that Cora Plether ships with. Uh, this is a US county map, although it's, uh, it's simultaneously a state map and a county map. You can see here the dark black lines are states, and then the light gray lines are counties. Um, but I mentioned here, focus on the pattern. So you can create this map just by loading dfpop county and then uh, calling the function county coroplet. So it's still just a single map, a single function call. Uh, this is a map of the zip codes or zip code tabulation areas in San Francisco. Uh, there's a separate package for the zip code map called Coroplether zip, but you create it the same way. And I wanna point out that for this map, having a reference map underneath it is very, very helpful. Um, I think that most people wouldn't recognize this as being San Francisco unless there was actually text on the slide saying San Francisco. Uh, the other point I want to make is that there's a county zoom argument here. And this county zoom is a number, 6075. And I'll be talking more about that later. But for now, I just want to say that um, in America, there's a naming convention called FIPS. FIPS codes and Calif uh, San Francisco is both the city and a county and the county FIPS code is 6075. Even smaller than a zip code is what's called a census tract. And there is a package called Cal Coroplether CA census tract for California census tracts. And uh, this is a really interesting map for me uh, Los Angeles, you may or may not know, is the largest county in America. It is similar to San Francisco. It is both a city and a county. And it has about 10 million people in it, which is much, much larger than any other county in America. 
And if you look at the income by census tract, you could see here that the, the southern and eastern portion of the city is uh, much poorer than the other portions of the city. And uh, the, the Census Bureau releases a national map for zip codes or zip code tabulation areas, but the maps of tracks are by state only. And so uh, I just used, I just packaged up California as an example. Uh, lastly, I, I mentioned I used to work at a real estate company and I created Coraplether really for um, looking at U.S. real estate, but I got a lot of requests for countries uh, to extend Coraplether to work with countries. And that's exactly what you see here. Uh, I load the data DF pop country and then just load the function uh, country Coraplet and you'll get uh, this map here. And the data comes from the World Bank's uh, WDI data set, World Development Indicators. And we had someone asking about um, India, Indian states, and uh, that's called administrative level one. So in geography, this map of countries is called administrative level zero. And just taking a step back, there are different types of maps. So maps of countries are administrative borders. Uh, maps of counties are administrative borders. Uh, zip codes are not administrative. Um, no one, uh, there's no laws saying where the borders of zip codes are. And, and similarly, um, tracks are not administrative. There's no mayor of a, of a tract. But uh, administrative level zero is country, and then the divisions within countries are called administrative level one. And that's because countries have different names for their subdivisions. In America, we call ours states. In Canada, they call them provinces. And in Japan, which is what we're looking at here, they're called prefectures. And you can create a uh, admin level one map of I think 220 countries in Coraplether with this package Coraplether Admin 1. And um, you just need to give it a country parameter. And for Admin 1, uh, administrative level one maps, uh, reference maps are often very useful because I, I think most people wouldn't know where Tokyo is on this map if, unless you happen to have spent a lot of time in Japan. Does anyone have questions about the more map section? Okay, if there are no questions about this section, then I will move on. Uh, I wanna talk briefly about what I skipped. So I mentioned at the, at the beginning that I wanted to cover four courses in one hour. I think I covered quite a bit of the information from my free course, Learn to Map Census Data in R. Um, and then there are these other courses, Map Making in R with Quarter Plether, Shape Files for R programmers, and Learn Shiny in an Afternoon. And I wanna tell you briefly about the areas I, I skipped from those courses. So this is map making in R with Coraplether, and I like to say that this gives you essential background on the maps. Someone earlier said, does, does your map of India include this division, this recent division of the states? And that's a really good question. Um, when you start getting serious about working with maps, you will, you will eventually learn that a lot of maps contain errors. And some of those, most of those errors are simply because uh, borders change and they change all the time. And so in this course, uh, I literally explain where every single map comes from. And I also tell you uh, common problems about dealing with those maps. And as an example, this is a map of um, what some people would say, income per by 
per capita income of zip codes in Manhattan, except it's not really zip codes. In fact, I have, I have three lessons about zip code maps in, in map making in R with Choropleather. And that's because zip code maps are the most complex that I've ever dealt with. Uh, zip codes are maintained by the US Postal Service and they're maintained for the sole purpose of making it easy to deliver mail. And this is the key point. The Postal Service, the US Postal Service, does not release a shapefile of zip codes. And that means that any map you see of zip codes is not official. And there's, that's just the beginning of the problems. For example, there are some, uh, some zip codes refer to naval ships that are just, you know, um, um, sailing around the ocean. So they, they're not fixed at all. There's some zip codes that are PO boxes, so they, they have zero area. And there are some zip codes that are just straight lines. They're, they're roads in rural places. So they don't encompass any area at all. And zip codes can be created, modified, and destroyed at whim. So there really are no official zip code maps. And when I say ZICTA up here, Z-C-T-A, that stands for zip code tabulation area, which is how the Census Bureau gathers statistics at a form that is like, or that resembles a zip code. But you have to be careful. Um, lastly, I didn't talk at all about what the actual maps are or how um, they exist as objects and are. But like everything else in Choropleth, there there's a pattern. The state map uh, is called state.map, the county map is called county.map, and so on. And if you look at that object, you'll see it has a region column. And that's that all of a sudden it may start clicking for you with why everything is a region or value or why your data has to be a region or value. It's because Choropleather merges your data to this underlying map. And so of course you need a region column to make that merge work. And if you type question mark state dot map, you'll see some information about the map. Um, your, let's, let's go back here. So your data has to have a region that exactly maps up to, um, to how the regions are spelled in this underlying uh, mapping object. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that I'm going to just uh, not help you at all. That, that's a very strict rule because a merge has to happen. But every map also has this helper object that ends in dot region. So state dot regions has the official spellings of the regions, but it also has these abbreviations, these two letter abbreviations. And it also has the FIPS code as both a character and a number. The official um, FIPS codes are characters, I believe, but in practice, they often appear as, as numbers. Next is this course, Shape Files for our programmers. And uh, the subtitle here is Custom Maps Made Easy. And when I say custom map, I'm not referring to um, uh, making the maps more beautiful or with a custom aesthetic. Uh, I'm saying a lot of people wind up with a shape file and they need to make a map out of it in R and they're kind of lost. They, they have no training for it. And all of the training online is sort of um, not to help you with that one specific task. And that's the exact specific task that I had um, that was very hard for me to learn. And then I turned around and made a course to help anyone with it. And, and I want to point your attention to this map. It, it may look familiar, but it's actually different. Um, you may think that it's the zip code map that we, we dealt with before, but it's not. Um, I live in the city and county of San Francisco, and it's divided into 11 supervisor districts. 
and I wanted to explore um, some of the data that San Francisco puts out by map. Um, so I got the data, and then I got this custom shape file that the city puts out saying where the borders are for the supervisor districts. And then I made a map, um, and you can see here the, the actual data is noise reports. So if you were dealing with, say, uh, wanted to make a, a map of Indian states, or, um, and you found that the admin one map that Quarterplether ships with is uh, no longer up to date, the task that you have to do is to get that the more modern shape file, import it into R, and then um, either map it with core plether or with something else. And that's exactly what this course teaches you how to do. And uh, more than just dealing with, with the R aspect of it, I also teach you how to use QGIS, which is a free GIS program. Um, and you often need to make modifications to shape files as a data analyst. For example, the US state map, the official map from the Census Bureau includes Puerto Rico, but um, I chose to remove it because I thought if I included it, um, then people would ask questions. Here's a great question from Jim. How does your course shape files for our programmers differ from the chapter in Winston Chang's book, Our Graphics Cook Cookbook? First of all, I highly recommend Winston's book. Uh, I think it's the first, um, it was my first introduction to ggplot2. It's fantastic. Um, unless he updated it recently, what, what Winston tells you is he assumes that you already have a map in R and you want to make it, you just want to render it with ggplot2. Um, if you wanted to make a map of, say, supervisor districts in, in San Francisco, you would want to view that in a real GIST program like QGIS first. You would absolutely want to view and inspect it first. R is not really good for um, exploring and modifying shapefiles. It's not a full-fledged just program in the way QGIS is. And whenever I have a mapping project, the first thing I do is I open up the shapefile in QGIS, and if I need to make modifications, that's what I do, and then I load it into R. And so I think that will be the biggest benefit you get if you take shapefiles for R programmers. Um, and if you... Um, look at the testimonials on the bottom, you'll, you'll see very similar things. A lot of people deal with polling data um, when they're custom voting district maps and they want, they find that um, minimal training in QGIS that data analysts need to be, to be very helpful. And then I, step-by-step, uh, step, I walk you through rendering it with base R graphics, ggplot2, and Choropleather, and of course, um, I think this is the only reference out there for uh, connecting a new shape file from um, uh, to Choropleather. Does that answer your question, Jim? I just saw that the exact same question came in as a duplicate, though. Yeah. Perfect. The next course that I have is called Learn Shiny in Afternoon. I actually, uh, I feel like I was on the, okay, thanks Jim. I, I really regret that I backed away from calling this course Make a Census Explorer with Shiny because that's really what it is. There's, co there's tons of resources for learning Shiny out there, but really the, the single app that we make here is using Choropleather to map, um, to let someone explore census data. And I have a demo at the end. Like I said, I gave this talk to the, to the CDC and they asked me to make an example, uh, to include an example from actual census data. And that's what I did and I did it with Shiny. I'll demo it later, but I wanna briefly talk about 
um, how I wind the impact that Shiny has had on my work. Um, I gave in the I started this talk by including a lot of slides about this is what U.S. states by uh, percent white, percent black, percent Hispanic look like. But what I have to do in that model, I am deciding what data and what maps to show you. And what Shiny lets you do is give people a tool to explore that data. So what we built here, and you, you can just kind of see it, there's a drop down over here that says, what statistic do you want to look at? And how many colors do you want to see? So you can explore that data, it creates the map, it outputs it as a table, and it lets you download the actual table. So that's what this course does. And again, I'll, I'll show you a demo of this uh, at the end. Does anyone have any questions about what I skipped for my courses? No, my course doesn't deal with making tabs in Shiny. It's really designed to take someone who isn't familiar with Shiny and to allow to to step by step let them build a a really cool app. I mean, if you if you're interested in uh, mapping demographic statistics, which, which most of my audience is, then uh, making this app is a great introduction to Shiny. And it's designed to, at each step, point you towards uh, places to go if you want to learn more. Great. So, that's what I didn't include from other courses I have. And now in the remaining few minutes, I wanna talk about other data integrations that Coraplether has, and I have not made any courses on this content yet. The first data integration I wanna talk about is US unemployment data. And this is data that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the API has query limits. And that's a, a problem for, for me because I wanted to map, you know, America has about 3,000 counties and I wanted to map all of that data. So what I did is I scraped and packaged that data in a separate R package called R unemployment data. And it has state data from 2000 to 2013 and county data from 1990 to 2013. And if you load that library and type uh, question mark to yeah, county unemployment, that's where you'll see all this data. And here's what it looks like. Of course, there's a region column. There's also some metadata, the county name, the state name, and then the remaining columns are just annualized unemployment statistics. And this next slide is why I love R so much. Uh, with a single line of code, you can create a box plot of this entire time series. And what really stands out to me here is that there's a huge jump between 2008 and 2009, and that's the, uh, the financial crisis. And then here, you could also see, man, there are some outliers. It's, it's unbelievable to me that some counties in the US ever had an unemployment rate of 40%. And because I'm interested in, in map making, I wrote this other function called county unemployment coraplet, which just takes a year and then we'll make the map. And you could see here, you know, the, the box plot doesn't tell you the geographic patterns of the unemployment rates. And you could see here that the, the middle of the country really has a, uh, had a low unemployment rate in 1990. Um, next, I want to talk about integration with the World Bank. The World Bank has uh, releases what it calls the World Development Indicators, which it describes as the primary collection of development indicators compiled from officially recognized international sources. It presents the most current and accurate global development data available and includes national, regional, and global estimates. 
And there's a fantastic package in R called WGI that connects to the WGI API. And from there, it was a short step to mapping that data. And there is a function choropleth there. You need, first of all, you need to load the WGI library. And then if you call choropleth underscore WGI, you need to give it the code for the data that you want to see. And here, because I was at the CDC, I chose life expectancy. And a few things stand out to me here. The, the most obvious is that um, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, really has a, uh, it's a cluster of low life expectancy states. And also, I was very surprised that America uh, wasn't in that, that top group. Does anyone have any questions about the other data integrations? Okay, so uh, this is the last section. Uh, I know we're nearing an hour. Uh, someone, I got a lot of requests from the CDC to make some examples. Um, so there's a question, what unemployment numbers does the scraped VLS data have? I forget it's, um, if you type question mark DF County unemployment, uh, you'll get information about that. Um, it is annualized data. I know they've seasonally and unseasonally and seasonally adjusted and not seasonally adjusted. Of course, the annual is not uh, seasonally adjusted because it's annual. I think there may be another classification, uh, but I forget the details now, but it is referenced. Um, the first request I got was from this website, chronicdata.cdc.gov. And uh, I went to that website and the first, um, I challenged myself to take the first data set I found. Oh, uh, there is a question. Um, why is Namibia black? And black is the default color that Corvopleptor uses for NA. And I think this means that Namibia didn't produce official life expectancy. And that's an option that you can change in Cora Blether. The, um, I challenged myself on chronicdata.cdc.gov to just take the first data set I could find and make a map of it. And the first one I found was this table from uh, about, from the BRFSS, which is I think the behavioral risk factors surveillance survey. I think that's what that stands for. And it's just about uh, cholesterol awareness. And it's actually a very, very complicated table because you could see here there's multiple years. And it's not included in the screenshot, but there's a couple of questions. You know, uh, have you had your cholesterol checked? And there's multiple answers uh, ever within the last five years. Um, and then that can be broken down by age group or educational attainment. And then do you have high cholesterol? And so there's multiple questions, multiple answers, and multiple years, and multiple um, uh, um, breakouts of the data. And so that's a great, uh, a great data set to use uh, Shiny with. And, and I did so. And if you visit cdctalk.com, you can get the code for this app but I'll just uh, look, I'll just go here. Um, let's run it right now. I'm gonna run it locally. So you can see we're looking at, um, they responded yes to whether they checked their cholesterol. And we're looking at age group 18 to 24, and we could look at 
65 plus, you can change the year. We can look for uh, states above and below the median and so on. And again, you could um, visit this, this URL to play with the app yourself. And if you go to cdctalk.com, you can also um, get the code. And, and what you'll be interested in the code is probably is here, the location is that two character state. And, and then I merged it in to get the lowercase state name. I, I could have also probably just made this lowercase to map up the region names. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the CDC data example? Okay, so I will just briefly tell you how to learn more if you want to learn more about, about this, um, about Choropleather. I mentioned that I have uh, four main courses. We covered uh, most of what you see in Learn to Map Census Data in R. I think we actually covered all of it, but it is a free course. So if you wanted to go through it on your own pace, I recommend starting there. It's free. Um, we covered uh, maybe about half of what's in map making in R with Choropleather. And we only really got to, to show the results of shape files for our programmers and learn shining after in an afternoon. Uh, the best way to, to take these courses, I think, is to join my membership site, profitableportfolios.co. It gives you access to all of the courses. There's also a members only forum where I can answer any questions you have. And I have monthly live office hours, recordings, uh, live events and so on. For example, in one of the live trainings I did, I made an R package from scratch uh, and answered questions as I went along. And you can see that um, you can watch that recording there now. There's uh, also monthly and annual subscriptions. And besides this technical content, it, there's also a lot of resources for helping people build portfolios of their work. Um, many people who I speak with are very interested in um, creating uh, interesting projects and um, then using them to highlight their, their work and, and communicate with prospective employers and so on. And uh, that's something I can definitely help you with. Someone asks, how does Choropleather compare to Leaflet. The main difference is that Choropleather uses ggplot2 to make the maps and ggplot2 only produces static images, whereas Leaflet is designed from the ground up. It uses JavaScript, so it allows a level of interactivity that Choropleather doesn't. Um, also, all of the customization that you would want to do with ggplot2, for example, changing border thickness or color, that if you're familiar with that syntax already, you can immediately apply that to Choropleather as well. Uh, I also mentioned during the, the talk that I am a trainer. So um, I mentioned to the CDC that I provide remote training, on-site training, as well as doing custom software development, if they had any needs for that. Does anyone have any questions about learning more? Okay, then I want to conclude by saying that these are the four maps I showed at the beginning. Uh, U.S. state income, U.S. county unemployment, um, life expectancy at birth, and Japanese population and you can now make each of these maps. And as a final reminder, before I go to questions, I wanna say that you can download these slides at cdctalk.com. Charles asked about the membership fees. Membership is $49 a month or $490 a year. So if you buy the annual membership, 
you get two months free. Someone asks if I have any training on using Postgres or Postgres, and the answer is no, I do not. I have extensive experience using MySQL, but not uh, using Postgres. But even then, I, I don't have any courses on using MySQL either. Great. Are there any other questions? All right. If there are no other questions, then thank you very much for coming out. And I will be posting a link to this recording later. Thank you.